Welcome to the formerly glorious fantasy kingdom of Duhan. I say formerly glorious because there's been a cataclysm of the most terrible kind. The green life-filled lands were struck by an apocalypse, the Flash, which shined like a bright light upon the people, their towns and nature itself, shattering and burning everything it touched. That's not all. Survivors of this end of the world saw the rise of evil creatures that were formerly kept in check with relative ease by the magical powers and warfare skills of the civilization that inhabited this land. The monsters originate from underneath the Queen's castle ruins and there's a massive sprawling underground labyrinth which was formed by the distortion of space during the Flash. We're talking about a serious magical nuclear bomb here. Sounds like some kind of uh, Conjurer's Bunker Buster special. As a lone adventurer who you get to create in the beginning of the game, our story begins from the relative safety of the town of Salem, which is nearby the ruins of the Queen's Castle. You've lost your memory in the flash and have to start piecing together clues about who you really are. A visage of an injured, broken down man appears before us, letting us know that our character is destined to be the savior of this hope forsaken land. The townspeople have seen him as well, and a certain warrior tells us the man from the vision seems to be a member of the former Queen's Guard from a time before the Flash. The Queen's Guard were a small band of the mightiest warriors and magicians in all of Duhan, working together in seamless cooperation, ready to lay their lives on the line for Queen Otelier. Where have the rest of them gone, or did they all perish in the Flash? You've heard that the Queen herself and the leader of the Queen's Guard, the sorcerer Ledua, are urging adventurers to delve deeper into the labyrinth and help the soldiers of Duhan deal with the source of this uprising of monsters. And so our story has begun. You'll start out by picking up quests from the local tavern and recruiting adventurers ready to join the party and head into the labyrinth. You can decide for yourself the initial motivation for heading down there. Is it because there's rumors of riches and treasures? Because you want to help those who are in trouble inside the labyrinth? Gain power or fame? Or perhaps just find out what happened during the flash? Your new comrades have their own motivations and they'll help you as long as your methods and actions don't upset them. You'll be able to gather a party of six heroes from the colorful characters you meet during your travels, or make the characters yourself, choosing their race, class, alignment, as well as naming them. You can even change their class as the game progresses, if for example your party doesn't function for some tactical reason. There's a pretty steep learning curve and just checking out the game's manual can be a really big help. It should be pretty easy to find in PDF format. This western style anime influenced dungeon crawling RPG is one really really heavy game from 2001 and it was released on PlayStation 2. It seems to have a pretty big fan base even today who swear it's the best installment in the entire wizardry series. What originally drew me in was the mood and atmosphere. It's partly melancholic and grey but also deep and mysterious, full of surprises. Sure, the graphics look super clunky by today's standards, but originally when I got into the labyrinth and started fighting enemies, I actually thought the animations were pretty solid. Now, let's take a closer look at the combat. Here's how it works. You look at the enemies through the eyes of your characters, and you can see your remaining health and status at the bottom of the screen. You choose actions and targets for your characters one by one, and as soon as you're done and start the combat, they will do their best to carry out your commands. The enemies will act as well, and the turn order is decided based on who has the highest agility. You can initially do things like attack, defend or cast destructive and healing spells. Pretty simple stuff. At first the enemies pretty much just scratch and maul at you trying to bring your hit points down, but along the way you'll start to meet enemies that are more complex.
they'll resist your attacks unless you employ spells and buffs alongside the basic methods. Enemies will also start casting spells and their attacks might start causing serious havoc to your party, including the back row heroes. Soon you'll have to start learning how to predict the attack patterns of the enemies, like they will usually try to finish off your weakest teammates that they can reach as fast as possible. You might also get poisoned, paralyzed, silenced, feared, energy drained, turned to stone, or surprise surprise, even killed. The weapons and armor you find might also be cursed, giving you further trouble. The game doesn't make it easy for you to get rid of those problems either. You'll need to head back to Salem and pay the temple for restoration and resurrection services. Later your priests or bishops can do these things too. Then again, maybe not. Now as you head deeper into the labyrinth, the distance back to town grows more time consuming. These extremely handy transfer potions will allow you to warp back to town instantly, which helps out a lot, and they're not super hard to come by either. The trek downwards will still take quite a bit of time because you can't avoid all the enemies, but the game helps out there too. You can gradually unlock shortcuts that take you instantly past several levels. There's stuff you need to return to the earlier levels for anyway, like to look for specific types of monster parts or just complete quests. Most floors stay the same every time you visit there, so you just gotta memorize the paths to take or fumble about until you find your way. A few of the labyrinth floors change their layout every time though, but in those levels you're basically only searching for a way down to the next floor or killing monsters to level up. The monster parts are extremely important by the way, because you can use them to make new spells and power them up to full capacity in the shop in town. In addition to the destruction and healing spells, there's specialty stuff like the map spell, which allows you to see areas you haven't visited yet as well as a larger view of the floor map. This comes in extremely handy because some floors are a nightmare to navigate. Levels can have multiple floors and you might be dropping down and climbing up getting confused as hell while being bombarded by the roaming monster attacks. There's a real sense of claustrophobia when you start to run out of spells and potions but the monsters just keep making threatening noise all around you, slowly closing in. You don't want to just take a transfer potion out the first chance you get because you'll have to make the trip back down again and it could take 10 to 15 minutes. You want to get as much done as you can each time you're down there. It's time consuming but damn addicting and satisfying. The difficulty curve is kinda genius because the faster you delve downward the faster you meet more powerful enemies. If you're getting your ass kicked, all you gotta do is stop progressing for a while and level up with easier monsters as well as spend money and materials upgrading your spells. Later in the game you unlock a way to basically replicate any monster parts you find, which is just critically important if you want to max out your spell levels for priests, bishops and sorcerers. Other classes including the samurai and thief can cast spells too, but to a much lesser extent. A small portion of monsters you meet are not evil, and your teammates whose alignment is good will lose trust in you if you kill the non-hostiles. That's right, there's a statistic of trust in the game. Why does it matter? Well, because during the game you begin learning a special set of techniques that used to be employed by the original Queen's Guard, called Allied Actions. Now this is what makes the game super fun and tactical. The higher your party's trust is, the more powerful allied actions you're able to perform. I'm not going to go super in depth, but you can do things like tell two of your back row heroes to get ready to use ranged weapons to interrupt melee attacks directed at two of your front row heroes. Or you can tell them to shoot an interrupting shot at the first enemy who attempts to cast a spell. You can also tell your front row warriors to do combined attacks that are either more devastating or simply impossible to dodge. These techniques can make designing tactics against complex enemy compositions pretty cerebral.
Another thing that twists my noodle are these quick time events, where you have to press a series of buttons to disarm a trap or open a lock. If you have trouble doing the right thing and staying good, you can also roll with a fully evil party. There's no big benefit in doing so. In fact, it just makes things more difficult since most friendly people you meet are of the good or neutral alignment, but there are some cool pieces of gear that you can only use while evil. Some of the enemies, especially towards the end of the game, can get super freaky and weird. This enemy was definitely designed under the influence of something potent. A few of them have abilities that are just stupefyingly overpowered. Now that's damage you can feel. Please bring ambulance! Now as you're adventuring, you'll constantly enter dialogue and gradually start to know the most important people who are down in the labyrinth with you, as well as uncover the plot surrounding the Flash. The plot is a thousand times bigger than the first few hours of the game imply, and by that I mean it flips out into massive proportions. The escalation happens gradually, so you have time to adjust your noodle. I've played this game a lot and saved a lot of time by avoiding some big mistakes I did the first time around, but this is still a 40 plus hour game. This game hits you right in the feels a few times. Bad things happen to good people and even to some of the friendly monsters who you meet repeatedly during your adventure. My favorite are the orcs. They're the comic relief in this game for sure. They have a special way of talking and some of them are such adorable, determined little troopers, like Mr. Francois here, meeting a nasty kobold. Uh, hey, Kobo! Uh, what do you want? Will you give me a broken sword? A uh, broken sword? Okay, I'll give it to you, just be thankful to me. Uh, that's... that's hurt. You mean Kobo. <clears throat> that's for stopping me. That's was be mean. He's be horrible. But I has got another one, so it's be okay. Oh, come on, give this guy a break. He's just trying to collect broken swords for materials. And yeah, it's an orc named Francois. Even I'll admit this game is a strange entry to the top 100 list, and even though it might seem like nostalgia is playing tricks on me, this is in my opinion an underrated gaming experience. I feel like I'm using my imagination a lot when playing this game. The graphics are pretty basic most of the time, so there's plenty of room to sort of change things around in my head, similar to when you're reading a book. We don't always see things the same way. Some might see these characters and start imagining their voices, mannerisms and fighting styles as a classic Dungeons and Dragons style. Others might see a Lord of the Rings style or even something entirely different, perhaps completely produced by their own imagination to fill in the missing pieces. The game sets the mood with different styles of music, which range from fast-paced rock or light electric metal to melancholic fantasy music, relaxed jazzy beats or even high-tension thriller music. Wizardry Tale of the Forsaken Land is a game that haunted me for a long long time during my first time playing it through. I had severe difficulties in finishing it. It felt like every floor threw new challenges at me, and yet I desperately wanted to know what was in the end of it all. So I pressed on despite constantly getting smacked around. I mean, even the final boss alone took hours upon hours of experimentation to defeat, learning all his tricks and patterns. It was so worth it when it was finally finished. What an epic experience, what a deep, crazy story. 
It feels fantastic to have finished this game again after a very long time too, and I look forward to the next time when I get to descend into the brutal hallways of the labyrinth with different characters in the group. If this ever gets a remake or remaster, oh boy. Now I'll head back to the surface for the last time and leave Salem behind as well. Time has come to move on to the next game on the list.